Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Tuscaloosa. I am Ruth Van Lillian, the minister. We are a covenantal community founded on love and a common devotion to our free faith. As we celebrate the burgeoning of spring all around us, let us welcome each other into this sacred virtual space. We especially welcome those visiting with us this morning. We are so glad you found us. We invite you to connect with us in the comments below or on our website and Facebook page. We join with all member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association in affirming and promoting the inherent dignity and worth of every person and justice, equity, and compassion in all human relations and all systems of society. We bear witness to the pain and suffering of black, indigenous, and other persons of color in communities all across this nation. And we continue in our commitment to dismantle systems of oppression in order to build a better world. Black Lives Matter. Good morning. I'm Anna Schuber, this morning's lay service leader. There is a link to our order of service in a video description below, along with other useful information. Our church website and Facebook page have information about our new online activities. Also, members and friends should read all the Newsnet emails, the weekly e-blasts, and the monthly online newsletter to stay updated on congregational news. The prelude prepares us for the service. We invite you to light a chalice of your own at home. This might be as simple as a candle in a bowl or something more elaborate that you've purchased or made. We light this chalice as a beacon of our faith and as a reminder of our commitment to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We worship together though we are at a distance by celebrating that which is sacred to us individually and collectively. Our opening words are by Alice Berry. Children of the earth and sky, we are nurtured and sustained 
given warmth and light from above and below. Supported by Earth's strong, firm crust, we build our homes, till the fields, plant our gardens and orchards. When we turn from self and seek to be aware, we will find holy light in human faces, in blossom, birdsong, and sky. Then earth is truly our home. And we are one with all earth's creatures, parents to the earth's children yet to be. Joy, thou goddess, fair immortal, offspring of Elysium, mad with rapture to the portal of the holy fane we come. Fashion's laws indeed may sever, but thy magic joins again. This is the time in our service when we share with one another our joys and our sorrows. If you're watching in the Zoom right now, you can put your joys and concerns in the chat. This morning we'll begin by remembering everyone in our nation struggling especially with the trauma that has been associated with the trial of Derek Chauvin and remembering the horrors of the murder of George Floyd. We want to remember our friend David, who has had to spend a little time in the hospital again. We're going to celebrate with Becky and Gary the family visit that they have been enjoying. And we understand our friend Susan is also expecting company soon, perhaps now. We celebrate with her as the pandemic recedes. We have more and more uh, such visits to celebrate. And we want to congratulate Emmy and Edie as they anticipate very soon receiving a new member of the canine persuasion into their household. Let us spend a few moments in silence and I'll close us with a few words. In this vast, beautiful, majestic earth, it is easy to feel that we are such a small, small part. It is easy sometimes to feel alone and to feel frightened in our aloneness. Let us remember that we are connected. We are connected to one another in our community. We are connected to one another across the globe. We are connected to every part of the web of life. May all the powers of life, by all the many names they are called, bless us this day, give us comfort and hope for the days to come. Amen, shalom, blessed be. Now light a final candle for all the joys and concerns which went unspoken today. Hi, I'm Judith. I'm your religious educator, and I'm going to read you a story today called Granddad's Prayers of the Earth. And it 
It's written by Douglas Wood. The story this morning harkens to our sixth source, which is the spiritual teachings of Earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. And this source dovetails beautifully with our seventh principle, our respect for the interdependent web of existence, of which we are all a part. When I was little, my granddad was my best friend. Being with him always made the world seem just right. Granddad and I liked to go for walks in the woods together. We didn't walk very far or very fast or very straight. While we walked, I would ask him questions about things I wasn't sure of. Why is it, Granddad? I would ask. And what if? And does it ever? One day, I asked my Granddad about prayers. For a long time, Grandad was quiet. He didn't say anything until we came to the tallest trees in the forest, and then he answered with a question. Did you know, he whispered, that trees pray? I listened closely, but I couldn't hear them. See how they reach for the sky, he said. They reach and they reach for clouds and sun and moon and stars, and what else is reaching for heaven but prayers? I thought about the trees and kept listening for them, and while I thought, I sat down on old mossy rock. Rocks pray too, said Grandad, pebbles and boulders and old weathered hills. They are still and quiet, and those are two important ways to pray. I thought hard about the rocks. I picked up a pebble and stuck it in my pocket. We walked a little farther and came to a small stream. The water splashed and sparkled, and tiny fish hovered in the shadows. Do streams pray? I asked. Streams pray too, he answered, and lakes and rivers and waters of all kinds. Sometimes they pray silently like rocks. They lie still and calm, reflecting clouds or birds or sunsets or the first evening star. Sometimes they pray with movement, flowing across the face of the earth, giving themselves to the ocean, giving themselves to the sky, and beginning their journey all over again. Sometimes waters pray with laughter, chuckling to their friends and rocks, and sometimes they pray by dancing, leaping into the air, and falling back again. These are all ways to pray, said Grandad. But there are more. The tall grass prays as it waves its arms beneath the sky, and flowers pray as they breathe their sweetness into the air. The wind prays as it whispers and moans and sighs. It is saying a prayer and singing a hymn at the same time. A bird prays when it sings the first song of the morning, and it prays in that silent moment just before it sings. And the robin's last song at sundown is an evening prayer. All the beings of the world pray, said my, my granddad, as they slip through the forest or sparkle in the water, as they climb mountain sides or soar into the clouds or burrow into the earth. Each living thing gives its life to the beauty of the, all life. And that gift is its prayer. Then we were quiet, my granddad and I. He was watching something far away, and I was thinking about all that he had said about rocks and trees and grass and birds and flowers. And finally, I asked him to tell me about the prayers of people. Granddad smiled, ruffled my hair. People pray some of the most wonderful prayers of all, he said. Bending down to smell a flower can be a prayer, said my granddad. 
quietly watching the sunrise, feeling the slow turning of the earth, and saying hello to a new day is one of the oldest prayers. Standing in the snowy woods on a winter day and watching your breath become part of the breath of the world is a way to pray. Making music or painting a picture can be a prayer. Holding hands around the table with family and friends, remembering all that holds us together and giving us thanks is one of the greatest prayers. Sometimes, said Grandad, people pray when they are sad or sick or lonely or have a problem too big to carry by themselves. They may say words they have learned from their fathers or mothers or granddads or grandmothers, but often they must find their own words. The important thing is to remember that the words will always be right if they are real and true and come from the heart. We had walked far enough and Granddad said it was time to go back, but I had one last question. Are our prayers answered, Granddad? I asked. Granddad smiled. Most prayers are not really questions, he, he said. And if we listen very closely, a prayer is often its own answer. Like the trees and winds and waters, we pray because we are here, not to change the world, but to change ourselves. Because it is when we change ourselves that the world is changed. My granddad and I went for many walks after that one, and I often listened for the prayers of the earth, but was never sure I heard them. And then one day, my granddad was gone, and no matter how hard I prayed, he didn't come back. He couldn't come back. I prayed and prayed and prayed until I couldn't pray anymore, and so I didn't for a long time. And the world seemed dark and lonely without my granddad. until one day I went for a walk. I found a big rock under some tall trees and sat down on it. Overhead the branches swayed and a breeze whispered in the leaves. I heard a stream flowing nearby and a robin singing from a honeysuckle bush. And I heard something else too, something in the sounds of breezes and birds and water. I heard prayers. The earth was praying just like my granddad said. So I joined in. Thank you, I prayed, for tall trees and sweet flowers, for still rocks and singing birds, and especially for my granddad. And as I prayed, something changed, and my granddad seemed somehow near. And for the first time in a long time, the world seemed just right. the earth, reach the sky, children ask the reasons why, in our lives the answer sure, on the they learn and grow. Out of gratitude for all we have been given and all we have now, we share our resources because we love and trust each other and because this church enriches our lives and empowers us to make our world better. We rely upon each other, members and friends, and we appreciate the payment of pledges and the generous donations to support the legacy, vision, and work of this church community. Contributions may be made by credit card, by using the link below or by mailing checks to UUCT. All non-pledged contributions will be divided between our Split the Plate recipient organization and our congregation.
never got to dance around a maypole, and frankly, I feel rather deprived. Methodists in Alabama didn't keep such seasonal springtime celebrations when I was young, and probably still don't. I think it's too late for me now. Maypole dancing is best done by children and youth who are shorter and more graceful than I am at this point. I love to watch them as they each grab their ribbon and begin weaving in and out as they dance around, and the ribbons make that colorful crisscross pattern from the top of the pole downward. Someone always messes up, of course, but no one cares, because it's too much fun, and like all performance art, it will not last, and no one will remember a tangle or two. I didn't learn about belting, till I was well-grown and studying for the ministry. Beltane is May Eve, the last night of April, and it's celebrated with fertility rite, pure and simple. Some version has been practiced in agricultural communities across the globe going back before recorded history. The basic idea is that humans engaged in lovemaking out in the fields as a communal act of worship, honors the gods who make the grain grow and bring a good harvest. Then everyone will eat for the next year and many families will be rewarded with new children in the winter. I became good friends with a colleague in ministry who was a devoted practitioner of Celtic neopaganism although in secret, because she was a Methodist minister. She shared with me that she and her husband celebrated Beltane in the traditional way every year to bless their vegetable garden. Living in a rural area with a lot of privacy made it easy to engage in such an ancient spiritual practice. And one particular year, they were rewarded exceedingly well for their efforts when nine months later, the gods presented them with their firstborn child. It was a fine and praiseworthy accomplishment for a couple of closeted neo-pagans, and their story has left me with a fondness for Beltane and May Day and those celebrations ever since. Everything spins. I mean everything. The earth, the moon, the solar system, the galaxy, even particles inside atoms are spinning, wobbling, and rotating. Everything spins, and so everything is affected by the spinning. Thus are we creatures born of cycles and seasons. Our lives spiral around the seasons over over while we move forward in time, growing, becoming, aging. Human beings observed these phenomena before there was written language. They hauled stones from great distances and set them upright in patterns that caught the sunrise on certain days of the year, as if they could somehow both honor and control the cycles of life. Without understanding the microscopic activity of reproduction, they observed in cause and effect across the plant and animal kingdoms how mature living things come together in specific ways, which result often in the creation of new living things through the messy, smelly, sticky fluids of bodies and stems of limbs and roots. New life is created nurtured and born into the world. The life force perpetuates and sustains, and understanding it in a pre-scientific era meant an anthropomorphization of that force as a god or pantheon of gods from whom the force comes. And to believe that life comes from such gods means believing that life can be taken away from, from us by them as well. Therefore, in such a belief system, humans are called upon to remember and honor the gods, hoping that they will give and sustain life 
for another season. In the modern day, Western culture has largely rejected such beliefs in favor of the proven and accepted laws and theories of the life sciences. There are some, however, who find a powerful emotional connection to the earth and to nature, which manifests in a fascination with ancient earth-centered traditions. They have developed spiritual beliefs and practices which enrich their lives and strengthen their connection to one another and to the earth. The sixth source of our Unitarian Universalist living tradition is the wisdom and learning we glean from the spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the cycles of nature. This source is the most recently recognized in our congregational association in conjunction with the increase over the past several decades in the number of persons who practice some form of modern pagan or neo-pagan spirituality. According to Dr. Jessica Zabrine Gray, a UU religious educator, curriculum developer, and pagan priestess, the umbrella term pagan includes specific religious traditions such as Wicca, Druidry, Santeria, and more, along with those who consider themselves earth-centered but not of a specific tradition. Nearly every earth-centered tradition honors the sanctity of nature as it manifests through the seasonal cycle of the year and the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. By honoring these cycles through rituals, pagans have the opportunity to participate in the sacredness of nature. Unitarian Universalism offers an excellent community for modern practitioners of pagan traditions. Dr. Gray explains that pagans find inspiration in all world mythologies. Many honor the duality between a female goddess and male god, while some only honor the goddess. Some believe in many distinct gods, which we call polytheism, while others believe that all mythological gods and goddesses are aspects of one divine force. Some believe God is everything, which is pantheism, or is within everything, panentheism. The same religious umbrella, <clears throat> which found room to recognize the agnostics and atheists in humanism uh, in the early part of the 20th century, also offers hospitality to those for whom the ideas, beliefs, and images of pagan traditions provide spiritual comfort and inspiration. Dr. Gray shares some of her personal experience in her writing about the UU-affiliated organization, The Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans, which is known by the acronym CUPS. In UU congregations, pagans interact in a broader religious community than they might find in smaller pagan organizations, such as covens, groves, or kindreds. UU congregations welcome pagans into interfaith dialogue and as participants in social action. I have practiced Wicca for 15 years and worked as a UU religious educator for eight. My first encounters with Unitarian Universalism were a goddess-focused course, a pagan hand-fasting or wedding, and the covenant of Unitarian Universalist pagans. The more I learned about Unitarian Universalism, the more it informed my spirituality and my ministry. In return, I have experienced UU worship, programs, and rites of passage enriched by elements of paganism. Unitarian Universalism especially appeals to pagan parents. In my own family, we celebrate pagan holidays, learn about the elements of earth, water, fire, and air, and experience nature together. But I also want my child to grow up in a spiritual community of children 
and to be exposed to many different beliefs. So we bring her to Sunday school at a UU church. Living as we do in a larger culture which has been strongly influenced by Orthodox Christianity, tempered with the desire for religious liberty, we UUs fiercely guard our free faith. Every person who has either been born into Unitarian Universalism or adopted it for their own values the welcome they have experienced where their own life-affirming beliefs are respected and where religious questions are honored at least as much as any answers and often more so. In my 16 years as a Unitarian Universalist, I have attended such a broad variety of religious services and acts of worship, including traditional Protestant-style Sunday services, drum circles, cornbread and cider communion, the flower ceremony, a Samhain bonfire, a Passover Seder, a Hindu holy celebration, Buddhist meditation, Christmas Eve candle lighting, Easter celebrations, solstice rituals, a St. Patrick's Day service in which the pagans brought the snakes back and chased St. Patrick out, Kwanzaa celebrations, humanist lectures, Earth Day festivals, Rosh Hashanah services, and more. Our faith umbrella is large with room for many. Now, it is probably fair to acknowledge that our openness does attract some religious dilettantes who come for spectacle and entertainment. However, this should not discourage us from our hospitality or from our embrace of religious variety. It is incumbent upon each UU and each congregation that every life-affirming faith be welcome with genuine respect and that every spiritual practice be met with kind curiosity and an eagerness to learn and grow. I remember a long time you, you saying to me, I tried meditation a few times. I met with the Buddhist group and I sat still and tried to quiet my thoughts but it just made me crazy. I just couldn't do it, so I stopped going. That statement spoke volumes about her experience of being UU. It told me that she was pleased to be part of a congregation which included the presence of a Buddhist meditation group. She was obviously curious about their practice, which was new to her, and she felt comfortable trying it out for herself. She also felt free to declare that having tried it, it didn't work for her. And she still honored their practice and supported their presence in her congregation. The influence of transcendentalism on Unitarian history led to the welcome for humanism, agnosticism, and atheism. It also brought an appreciation for the spiritual experience many glean in the great outdoors and thus to the early conservation movement. That movement has grown into our UU commitment to environmental and climate justice. And in the midst of those developments in the last 50 years or so, the humanists and the pagans found each other at that intersection and have been working together ever since in a marriage of passion for the natural world. Druids and witches show up in their flowing robes to march alongside humanists in their t-shirts and jeans, and the work of saving the earth continues within the strange and beautifully varied family which is Unitarian Universalism. It was largely the influence of the pagan group in our UU family which led to the adoption of the seventh principle about our commitment to protecting the interdependent web of life. UU teacher and writer Selena Fox shares part of her story. I was part of the process of crafting and adopting the seventh principle. 
my experience and practice of paganism fit well within UU worldviews. I am the founder of the Circle Craft Path, a synthesis of old pagan folkways, multicultural shamanism, transpersonal psychology, and eco-spirituality. I am thankful that the UU communities support pagan perspectives and pagan religious freedom issues and draw on pagan stories, songs, spiritual practices, and celebrations. Our pagan kindred have brought much to the UU table and continue to enrich our ever-becoming free faith tradition. Earth-centered beliefs and practices are a part of Unitarian Universalism and can be found in our hymns, our readings, our religious education curricula, and our justice work. Our neo-pagan siblings have much to teach the family. And perhaps we may discover that there is more than just a little pagan in all of us. Amen. Shalom. Blessed be. that are shown at the bottom of your screen. As we extinguish this chalice flame, let us remember that we carry the light within ourselves, which brings healing to a broken world and hope for the days ahead. Siblings and kindred receive this pagan blessing. May the forces of the six directions, north, south, east, west, up and down, bless you and keep you as you go forth this week. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>